how these <coughs> will overlap and to compensate for the shape. Um, but the probability that all keys will overlap is going to be pretty slim. I guess, of course, it depends on the size of the matrix. Um, so, so that was how we assign keys to devices. Now, how do we create one of these key management blocks? It's going to be a matrix, and this is the simplification of the way it really works, but um, let's use it. Um, it's going to be a matrix of the same dimensions as the uh, where we derive the keys from. Um, but now, for each cell of this matrix, we're going to have the encryption of Km, which is, if you cannot see, it's repeated in every <coughs> single cell, but encrypted with the, cell that car with the key that corresponds to this cell. So now, if I'm, say, device A, and I want to process this key management block to obtain Km, what I'll do is I'll say, okay, in column one, do I have, uh, what's my key? this one right here. So I come here and I um, decrypt KM and I'm done. Now device B wants to do the same. Instead of going here, it goes here because it knows this key, but it's an encryption with a different key of the same KM. So both device A and device B obtain the same key and now I can use that key to encrypt the content itself. So again, this works. It, it, um, it follows the function of the to revoke device B, to exclude it from computing this. So what I do is I, <coughs> in the matrix, I have garbage in each of these positions. Um, now notice that in this example, um, I kind of nuked one of device A's keys. And that was kind of an accident, a side effect. Because device A is still good, we trust him. Um, but it's not a big problem because device A still has all these other keys. And if device A wanted to process this, it would come here and it would be able to, um, to recover KM, but device B would come here and it would find garbage. And here the same and so forth. And then it runs out of keys. And now it doesn't know any more keys, it cannot compute KM. So we've accomplished in the matrix the equivalent of what we did in the, um, in the uh, one-dimensional example. Now this becomes a lot more practical. Um, for example, in, in the new DVD audio, um, I think about three megabytes are allocated to, um, to send in this, uh, this matrix, this data. And that supports billions of devices. I think the plan is, um, I don't know how, what the total number of devices is. But how, how, uh, is that unique for every device or unique for every brand or what? Each individual device, each instance, yeah. gets a different combination of keys. Your disk man and my disk man are different. Yes. Yeah. And the reason you want to do that is so that if my disman, if I go at my disman with a soldering iron and I open it up and you know shave off layers of uh, silicon to extract my keys, and, and I write five lines of Perl, <laughs> somebody would want to make sure that my device and all the clones that are running those uh, five lines of Perl don't work, but they don't want to damage you because you didn't do anything and your device is still in one piece. So, okay. how can you tell that happened? Right. Because you'll get his key. So, the forensics aspect allows me to detect which keys have been compromised, but first I need to get my hands on one of these clones. The easiest way is to download the five lines of Perl, um, run it through our uh, forensics uh, tool and it will spit out what the original keys were. Now, of course, what you could do is you break the device, you create a non-compliant device, and you never tell anyone. 
and now you can do whatever you want with the content. And the answer is, we don't care. Because really the damage that you individually can cause to the whole business is so tiny that it doesn't even pay to try and find you know, who you are. Now, if you try to make a business out of it, if you try to um, have a mass distribution, then it becomes a lot more important. And you, you're no longer flying under the radar. Now, part of the work we do um, at Almaden is uh, this and new algorithms for broadcast encryption. Um, one of the, uh, the newest algorithms is, um, we've actually proposed this to, to one of the um, IRTFs um, for um, multicasting, is uh, instead of being based on a matrix, it's based on a tree. I'm not going to go into details of how this works, but um, one of the very nice advantages of this is that first, you don't get this case of um, invalidating keys of a device that is uh, what we call honest but unlucky. It's a device that's compliant, but for as a side effect, it got one of its keys revoked. So that could never happen here because we can pinpoint individual devices. And the other nice uh, aspect of the tree is that if, say, a whole model of, of a device, all the different instances of the same model have a systematic flaw, then um, we could go in and revoke a group of devices with just one revocation message. Winamp. That Winamp, piece of software yeah. on a PC. You could revoke, kill every Winamp out there for whatever these songs are. So again, this is um, technical capability that mm -hmm. I'm talking about. Okay, right. right. Whether, whether and how you would do this in reality is a different story. Absolutely. So you have to run Windows to use Winamp stuff? Yeah, you do. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to skip because um, we had some interesting discussions, but I think some of these issues are not. I'm not going to be cover every, be able to cover everything. Okay. They'll be in the notes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I mentioned CPRM and CPPM. We also have. Um, been working on something called EMMS, Electronic Media Management System, which is a, a, it's a DRM system. Um, we have some activities in data hiding and watermarking. Uh, we've participated in several standards and industry groups. We're part of 4C, which is the group that um, makes available CPRM and CPPM. Uh, we've participated in CPTWIG, if you've never gone to CPTWIG, it uh, stands for Content Protection Technical Working Group. It's uh, quite an interesting experience if you're interested in uh, digital media. Um, it's a, a meeting that occurs, I think, about once a month in LA, and you have all the major studios, all the major uh, technology vendors, device manufacturers, and a lot of lawyers in one big room. So it's a, it's a very interesting experience. Um, uh, I've just recently been involved with uh, OMA, the Open Mobile Alliance. Uh, we've participated in digital video broadcasting. It's the alphabet soup of uh, standards. Um, we work on software tamper resistance, which is an interesting research topic. Um, and um, one of my favorite topics, something I've been working on for the last uh, year or so, is uh, content protection in a home network. So assuming that devices are going to uh, interact more like computers, so you know more devices are going to be either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi enabled, and um, or even Ethernet. Um, the question is, how how do we uh, how do we design a content protection system uh, for
for this usage model, which is quite different from you know, what you would have with physical media. So that's what I um, <coughs> talk to you about next. Um, we have this uh, code name uh, XCP for extensible content protection that uh, we use for our project. Um, the idea is to support what's called a trusted domain, which mean, really means that several compliant devices are grouped together to act as one. And content can move freely among my devices. But of course, we, we want to make it so that my neighbor cannot use my content, so that I cannot use the system for indiscriminate distribution, but um, I can still use it within, within my, um, my household. Um, our system is based on broadcast encryption, and it's, uh, it's really peer-to-peer. -peer. This is peer-to-peer -peer at a small scale, as opposed to peer-to-peer -peer for Netscape. Um, but it has some really nice advantages, um, like uh, fault tolerance, and um, we don't really need to know ahead of time what the topology is going to be. As a consumer, yes. aren't you paying for copyright based on device and so in other words a DVD is encrypted on the media you can play it on a DVD player but once you move it to different devices as a consumer you're paying for copyright based on device well that's the uh, current model in particular for DVD but uh, what we're proposing here is a new technology that enables a different model. Um, and what we've been doing is we've been talking to the different content owners, trying to create some support for this uh, different usage model. And the usage model would be, um, there's a trade-off, right? I think both are reasonable. It's nice for you to be able to have you know, a piece of media and give it to your friend, and they can play it too. But here we're talking about a, a you know, parallel model where you basically buy content for you, it plays on all of your devices, but then it will not play uh, on your friend's uh, device. So these are just two, two different usage models and the technology to enable them is uh, different. Is, are you saying there's no physical media or there is physical media in this model? Uh, there doesn't have to be physical media. <coughs> well, you could use physical media <coughs> potentially. Because then I could give it to my neighbor. Well, but the idea is, so there's a notion which is um, what the content is bound to, yeah. right? So in, say, DVD or yeah, DVD, DVD audio, DVD. the content is bound to the media. Yeah. The idea is if I copy the bits to a different, a similar media, yes. the second media doesn't work, right? Yeah. If I do a bit-by-bit -bit copy, yeah. it doesn't work in, because in it's the bound to the original model, model. Yeah. right? In this model, what we're saying is it's bound to you yeah, right. and to all of your devices. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, and, and did you get to the part yet of how you do this binding to the, to the owner rather than to his devices? Do they right, so, so what we're really saying is um, binding to the owner is hard. So we use a proxy for that. And the proxy is a collection of devices. So um, there, there are really different trade-offs of what we wanted to do, what we set out to do with this system is create a system that is, um, we maintain some level of control for content owners, but doesn't uh, force you, the consumer, to have to help in this process, because it's not in your interest to help. So we wanted a system that is uh, transparent, and we also wanted to protect the um, um, privacy of consumers. So I guess the initial idea of binding to the user would be, which we don't, we, we, which we uh, decided not to use. But the the initial idea would be, okay, you have, you buy a device, you have to register it. You go to this, you know, central database of devices. And, and there's a record for 